with life's full literacy fund. Myself, Vipra, the moderator, and I welcome you all in today's virtual webinar, Coronavirus Living the Wavy Scenario. Since past many months, we have seen and heard a lot about COVID-related aspects, but as we move forward, we discover more to this subject. Complications of COVID-19 have long-lasting effects, so to give us a brief about the COVID on health, I would like to call Dr. Samantha Gelman and Dr. Edeline Vidrar. Dr. Gelman is an international medicine uh, internal medicine resident in California, and Dr. Vidrar is a family medicine resident in New Jersey. We are proud to have you with us. The, the duo gives us secret tips on beauty, health, and wellness. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, Adeline will not be able to make it because she's at work and I'm literally doing this right before work. So we're trying to find time to squeeze everything in, but thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us in such a busy schedule. So as a member of Canadian civil organization, I represent the Canadian movement towards reconciliation with the indigenous people here on the international stage. To acknowledge the land in which lies for literacy operates is to recognize the land and in organizations such as these operates on traditional land with ancient roots and traditions. Lies for Literacy stands with the members of First Nation communities as they fight for their basic rights to education, water, and housing. We stand with the members of these communities as they fight for Aboriginal land titles and work to be heard by the federal government of Canada. Most importantly, we call on the Canadian government to enact on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. So I would like to start, but if you could brief about a few words about the COVID-19 burden. Well, the burden of COVID-19 was definitely a tough one. I think in the United States, at least where I could kind of speak from because I work here, it, it has kind of been passing more or less, which is a great thing, but we don't know what the future is going to hold. But then looking at other places, like looking at India, for example, it's been a really hard shock over there and I feel it's one because of mass population but two because of the lack of resources that people have over there and that has been something we actually talk about on rounds we've talked about it at work for sure because it's very tough to see that we're finally getting past it and some places are still not and even though we already know kind of how to manage it more or less or at least the supportive care aspect of it we've already kind of harnessed on that and we know what we're doing with that that it's kind of sad that other people see that we can do it, but they don't have the access to the means in order to be able to. So I think the burden of COVID-19 was uh, very hard for everyone in the beginning. I think that now people in retrospect, everything hindsight is 2020, right? So we can see and we're like, oh, we should have done this. We should have done that. But it just showed that a lot of us were not prepared. Like we're supposed to be a super house, the United States, and we were not prepared. And the things that were going on in New York and then in Los Angeles after, and then with the second wave, even with the second wave, we were still underprepared. It just shows that there's still so much for all of us to learn. But the places that are already at a disadvantage are going to be more at a disadvantage. So I think that's the general spiel of the COVID-19 burden. So moving on to the next question, what difficulties do you face as a physician in getting people to follow the rules? Also, any specific myths or facts which you came across? Um, in terms of difficulties, I mean, it's uh, the real problem is that a lot of people don't believe that it's real, which is mind blowing. I think that like, and there are friends that I have, family members that I have that kind of don't concern themselves with it. And that doesn't really much bother me because like, you know, people are entitled to their opinion and whatever. But what bothers me is people who go and try to like use social media influence and all that to pretend that this is not real. That's what then bothers me because then you're trying to convince someone next to you to believe the way that you do. You're entitled to your belief, but if you don't have fact-based information behind it and you've never worked in the hospital like we did and saw what we saw, then you cannot be out there telling everybody what you think, you know what I mean, without hard facts. So I think that was the major issue in the world of social media and everyone spreading all the stuff. I've, I've noticed some people that I know who have a huge following and they're just saying, oh, the masks are fake. This is fake. Whether you believe it is or it isn't, these are the rules that we kind of are living by right now. And even if they, let's say, let's say if they did not work, wouldn't the chance of them working make you want to at least try that? What is the harm of you wearing the mask? You get what I mean? Yeah, You're not going to die from wearing the mask, but you could potentially hurt someone by not wearing one. 
so I don't understand why we keep having this argument like it's like it, we're making people do something that's going to kill them now for the vaccine from the vaccine standpoint maybe that's a little bit of a different story but again there's research behind it it's back it's been back for 50 years or so yeah there hasn't been a vaccine for covid but we didn't have covid 19 so obviously that wasn't gonna happen so i think um i understand people's concerns with regards to the vaccine but when it comes to the mask there's nothing harmful about wearing it so let's just let's just let that thing go unless you have certain conditions that you are unable to wear a mask and it can affect your breathing. But for the most part, it's pretty safe. So yeah, I think um, that that whole misinformation world has been very tough. So, and what I've noticed is that now that people are allowed to come into the hospital, they're kind of starting to see how real it is. Like when you go to the places where there's a lot of COVID patients, you get to actually experience it. But now it's starting to calm down. So they're letting people in. You still have to wear the mask just in case for the transmission and whatever. But hopefully soon that'll all be over. I mean, at the height of the pandemic, if people were able to come to the hospital and see what was going on, they would have had a complete different perspective. Right, very well. Yeah. So uh, next question, do you believe that only maintaining personal spaces will prevent the transmission? No, I think it's a combination of everything. And the reason why I think it's a combination of everything is because we're not perfect, right? So we could keep six feet. But I don't, like um, we can keep six feet from each other, for example, right? But if I'm sick, even with the six feet, I don't know how far my particles actually travel, right? If I'm sneezing, coughing or whatever, that's number one. But I think the six feet is the safest bet because they've tested it and have shown that like that's the farthest that it would go. Um, obviously washing your hands, right? I could be six feet, but if I touch something that has a virus on and then touch my face, that doesn't matter. That part doesn't matter. So I think it's a combination of things, washing your hands, um, standing six feet apart, and obviously wearing the mask as much as you can. Um, because the mask, the one interesting thing that I thought with the mask was like, um, there were less people getting the flu this year. And that kind of just goes to show uh, the flu, I believe, I'm not an infectious disease specialist, so don't quote me on this, but uh, the flu, I believe, is a bigger particle than the coronavirus. So it makes sense that the flu doesn't pass through the mask. And that might be why a lot of people have been less likely to get the flu this year. So just an example from all illnesses. And you know, there are certain, um, there, every year you see people who wear masks regardless of COVID or not. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Right. So moving to the next question, uh, what actions should people take to avoid contracting with the COVID-19? To avoid get, contracting it? So yeah, it's, it would be the usual, right? Uh, washing your hands, obviously taking care of yourself, right? If you're a healthy person, like the, it's, your odds are better, right? As, a, as you can see, like with COVID, the people who fared pretty bad for the most part, except for a few outliers, for the most part, those were the people who had other conditions, right? They had either sleep apnea, hypertension, um, high blood sugar levels, things like that. So I think taking care of yourself, number one, and being an overall as healthy as possible is the first thing. The second thing is obviously washing your hands, um, eating the right foods, eating your regular vitamins. You don't have to go crazy with the vitamins just because of COVID, but in general. And then of course, um, wearing the mask, social distancing, and just doing your part, getting vaccinated if that's something that you wish to do. Absolutely right. So yeah. next is, uh, do you have any better way you can suggest in order to make different tasks easier, but at the same time preventing the disease, especially in mass transportation or school system types? So the school systems are tough. Um, I know in New York, like because uh, my little brother is about to go and he's in high school, but his first year was spent at home. Obviously, you want that interaction. So I do agree with people being back in school. Who the hell wants to keep people at home? The social interaction is like gone. And it's really sad, honestly. But also, it depends on the age group, right? Little kids, they're not going to be too attentive on wearing the mask all day and doing things like that. Um, and also vaccinating them. It's not, I believe it hasn't been yet approved for kids under 16, or maybe it was 12. So, you know, I think it kind of, you have to weigh the fact of maybe getting people tested as a way probably before, or if there's any symptoms in the family, or if the parents notice that your kid's having a runny nose, yes, it may or may not be COVID, but it doesn't matter, right? Because when the kid goes in and has a runny nose, 
that usually spreads to every other kid in the classroom. So I think knowing that when your kid has any exhibits, any sort of symptoms, whether they're COVID related or not, it's best mm-hmm. to keep them at home for a few days. So, you know, they're not transmissible and then bring them back in. Um, I think that's going to be, I'm not a politician, thank God. So I think that's going to be something that we have to work on, but in the younger age group, it'll be harder in the older age group in kids in high school and up, you can kind of treat them the way you treat the rest of us, I think. Right. So uh, what, according to you, should government do in the health sector to combat such type of disasters? Um, so I guess the, the big thing was that when there was warnings about it, people didn't, I don't really get into politics much because I see where everyone comes from, or at least I try to. So I think the issue was that we kind of knew what was going on, but we didn't know that it was going to affect us. And that's not unreasonable, I guess. But now that we look back, we're like, wow, we could have avoided this if we just started earlier. But the reality of it is it was here a lot earlier than we thought anyway. So I don't think that would have really changed much. Uh, But I will say as soon as we already knew that it was a threat to us or like any country, as soon as they knew that it was a threat to them, should have done anything as much as they can to get the PPE and all of that and um, Mm -hmm. start the supportive care and all that earlier. I think that was the only thing. But, you know, it's very hard to say. We're always pointing fingers and blaming people for things in general. But when you look back at it, it's it's easy to say what we should have done. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In that right. moment, right. look, I've never dealt with this before. I, I'm a third year resident and I was, what the hell am I doing? I, I didn't know anything. So it was very hard and it was very tough for us because we're looking at our attendings for answers and our attendings don't have answers because at the end of the day, we're still human beings, right? No matter if we're doctors, nurses, politicians, regular humans, like it, we're all regular people. So, yes. and I think people need to take that and understand that, that none of us are have superpowers or can predict what the future holds. So in accordance with your experience till now uh, by handling the situations in the hospital, do you believe that the society is well informed about the precaution that they should take to prevent the disease spread? I think they definitely know, I th- I, I, at least here. In California, it has been uh, pretty strict, at least for the most part. Uh, And they know, right, if you're coming into the hospital, you will not get let in if you're not wearing masks. You will not get in if you don't do the temperature check. So I think people have come to terms with that and they kind of know what they need to do. I mean, of course, in other areas, like if uh, I was in Arkansas not too long ago, there the masks aren't mandatory. So when I go to the supermarket, some of us are wearing them, some of us are not. So people will follow whatever the mass population is doing, right? So if in Arkansas, they normalize that you can or you cannot wear the mask, so it's up to you what you wanna do. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with it, but that's what they do there. And that's why the population is doing that. So if they told everybody there to wear a mask and everybody did it, then that there would be no question about it. And the person next to you would be wearing one too. Here, they kind of were like, everybody got to wear a mask when you come inside. They wouldn't seat me at the table at the restaurant if I didn't wear a mask at the door. So they'll, they'll, even if you show up without a mask, they'll tell you to put it on. Now it's becoming a little more relaxed, but also now mm-hmm. a lot of people are getting vaccinated. So I think... Um, mm-hmm restaurants and all those places are becoming to feel more safe about letting people do that. Right. So uh, what are the appropriate personal protective equipment sets? So you mean like N95 and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So for in the, the general hospital, public. So for the general population, I mean, initially they said to use these like you could put your t-shirt around your face. You could put other stuff. Honestly, I went ATVing um over like winter break and those things do not prevent everything anything i had sand all up in my mouth so i do not believe in that but um then they said to do the regular surgical masks and the cloth masks so i think those can work obviously again they work in combination of being six feet apart right the the notion is that the general population isn't in counting like with COVID patients all the time. You don't knowingly know that the person next to you has COVID. So you don't need the N95 and all of that. Plus it's a lot harder to breathe than those, you know, and you have to get fitted for those to make sure that they're working too. So for the general population, just wearing the regular masks, washing your hands, you could also do the cloth masks. I think that that will suffice. Right. So uh, the last question we would like to know about your experience as a frontline doctor. 
Yeah, so I think this is what I could speak of the most because again, I'm not an IID specialist. I only know what I've seen. And I think that's how I uh, base, when people ask me, do I get vaccinated or not? Do I do this? Do I do that? That's how I base like my options on. Obviously I do my fair research, but I'm not a researcher. So I can't tell people, oh, statistically speaking, this, this, and this. But uh, for me, it was like, when I came to the vaccine, at least it was for me getting COVID or getting the vaccine, right? Because as a healthcare worker, I see COVID patients. So the likelihood of me getting COVID is a lot higher than someone in the general population, or so we say. And um, Mm. with that in mind, I was like, so I'm either going to get COVID and I would have anxiety about seeing patients in the beginning, you know, I would wear the mask. I'm like, am I wearing the mask? Right. Cause I only would wear a 95 very limited time when I was seeing TB patients. And that was once in a blue cause TB is not really a thing, especially here mm-hmm. in the state. Um, so w- that was the only time. And even then when we thought it was suspected TB, they would all end up coming out negative anyway. So I'd be like, Oh, okay. Who cares in retrospect, if I wore my N95 correct or not, you know, whereas with COVID I'm going into a room knowingly that the patient has COVID wearing this N95, the patients are coughing, they're crashing. You have to intubate them. So these, these things initially, I had a lot of stress with that. I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Cause I never thought that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you're a doctor, you signed up for this. But the reality of it is when we were in medical school, I never thought I'd have to be risking my life to save lives. I'm, you know what I mean? It's, it's not something that we knew that that's what we were going to get ourselves into. Of course, like we took an oath, we're going to do what we need to do. But when that time mm-hmm. comes, you can't blame us for being anxious about it or being scared about it. Because at the end of the day, we're also human beings. I think that was, that was the thing that really got to me um so as time progressed uh i became more and more comfortable right you know you start noticing you're not getting sick i still had the anxiety before getting into the room but you start noticing that like okay i'm doing okay i'm wearing my n95 right the seal's there it's good um and then also seeing the changes that it made in the patients right what time we started seeing it wasn't everybody dying and so that fear for me also started subsiding because I started seeing my patients do better. And as my patients started doing better, it made me more comfortable because then it was like, okay, I'm doing what I need to do for them. But also for me, God forbid, if I do get it, I should be okay now. <laughs> you know, you kind of, it's kind of, it sounds a little bit like selfish when you say it, but you also have to worry about yourself in these situations. And that's the one thing that my program was very important on. They were like, put yourself first. Because if you aren't here to, to, if you're not healthy, then you can't protect those around you. And I think that's what a lot of people forget because we're not just recyclable. There's not going to be another physician potentially if we're all sick, right? So we really tried to work it out in a way where we kind of went in groups, we avoided exposure, but we made sure that our patients are taken care of, but we also protected ourselves at the same time. So that was the experience in the hospital and things started to move forward and better. And now I have people who come in, they show me like kind of COVID symptoms. I test them, they more or less, most of them end up being negative. And it's because people are doing the right thing. A lot of people were infected. So, you know, that herd mm-hmm. immunity aspect might be kicking in and the vaccine. So mm-hmm. I think that transition of going from being really scared to being more or less confident about it. And also the medicine that has changed that, That has really changed everything. Plus seeing the patients improve, I think was the biggest thing. I think that alleviated a lot of the anxiety about yourself and also about what you're Mm -hmm. doing as a physician. Right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, That's the end. Like we had three questions to ask you. Yeah. Thank you for being here and happy second birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're just getting back into it. We're moving and I'm starting fellowships. There's so much going on. So uh, Adeline and I have been a little bit MIA, but we're definitely getting back into it. And hopefully we can plan some more events in the future once our schedules are set. And I will let her know. I wish she she wished she would have been here. But, you know, we get busy. (laughs) Yes. Thank you guys so much. Let's talk soon. And then we could do more stuff if you guys want in the future. Yeah, sure. We would love awesome. that. And if would you need help with anything, you. let us know, like with applications or whatever your plans are. Keep us posted. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Bye. Bye bye.